Thank you for joining us tonight. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Gold text on a white background. Live from NYPL logo. Live from NYPL presents All About the Story. Leonard Downey Jr. with Judy Woodruff, Kevin Merida, and Elizabeth Green. October 8th, 2020 at 8 p.m. EDT. This slide contains an image of the featured book jacket. In gold and white text on a black background, all about the story, news, power, politics, and the Washington Post, Leonard Downey Jr. There is a collage of Washington Post front pages scattered across the cover. Some of the visible headlines refer to Nixon, Clinton, and the Unabomber. Black text on a white background, all about the story is available for purchase online from the library shop nypl.org slash shop. Proceeds benefit the New York Public Library. Plus, receive a free commemorative 125th anniversary tote bag with your purchase. Black text on a white background. This slide features an image of the same book jacket for All About the Story with the Simply E logo. Reserve a copy of All About the Story for free with a New York Public Library card available through Simply E on iOS and Android. Black text on a white background, recommended reading, more books that take you behind the story. 10 Days in a Madhouse by Nellie Bly, Personal History by Katherine Graham, She Said by Jody Cantor and Megan Tuohy, Race Against Time by Jerry Mitchell, Crusade for Justice by Ida B. Wells, Another Day in the Death of America by Gary Young. Check out these titles and more on Simply E. Accessible formats available through nypl.org slash talking books. Black text on a white background. Read, think, vote. Make an informed decision. Read as if your vote depends on it. NYPL's 2020 election reading list is available at nypl.org slash election 2020. This slide features a blue box with a line of red, white, and blue stars running across the middle and images of 12 different book jackets from the election reading list, including America for Americans, Our Time is Now, The End of Ice, Begin Again, No Justice in the Shadows, this changes everything. Drawing the vote, unrigged, good talk, give us the ballot, why we're polarized, and push out. Black text on a white background, live from NYPL, election edition. Tuesday, October 13th at 8 p.m. EDT. All we can save. Women at the Forefront of Climate Justice. Scientists, activists, journalists, and artists summon truth, courage, and solutions for the climate crisis. Featuring Camille Dungy, Rihanna Gunwright, Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, Sarah Stillman, and Jane Zelikova. Thursday, October 15th at 7 p.m. EDT. Political Roundtable with the New York Review of Books. Contributors to the New York Review of Books examine and debate our moment of political division and crisis. Featuring Jamel Bowie, Pamela Carlin, Mark Lilla, Timothy Snyder, and Brenda Wineapple. For more information and to register, visit nypl.org slash live. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Gold text on a white background. Live from NYPL logo. Live from NYPL presents All About the Story. Leonard Downey Jr. with Judy Woodruff, Kevin Merida, and Elizabeth Green. October 8th, 2020 at 8 p.m. EDT. This slide contains an image of the featured book jacket. In gold and white text on a black background, all about the story, news, power, politics, and the Washington Post, Leonard Downey Jr. 
there is a collage of Washington Post front pages scattered across the cover. Some of the visible headlines refer to Nixon, Clinton, and the Unabomber. Black text on a white background. All About the Story is available for purchase online from the library shop, nypl.org shop. Proceeds benefit the New York Public Library. Plus, receive a free commemorative 125th anniversary tote bag with your purchase. Black text on a white background. This slide features an image of the same book jacket for All About the Story with the Simply E logo. Reserve a copy of All About the Story for free with a New York Public Library card, available through Simply E on iOS and Android. Black text on a white background. Recommended reading. More books that take you behind the story. 10 Days in a Madhouse by Nellie Bly. Personal History by Katherine Graham. She Said by Jody Cantor and Megan Tuohy. Race Against Time by Jerry Mitchell. Crusade for Justice by Ida B. Wells. Another Day in the Death of America by Gary Young. Check out these titles and more on Simply E. Accessible formats available through nypl.org slash talking books. Black text on a white background. Read, think, vote. Make an informed decision. Read as if your vote depends on it. NYPL's 2020 election reading list is available at nypl.org slash election 2020. This slide features a blue box with a line of red, white, and blue stars running across the middle and images of 12 different book jackets from the election reading list including America for Americans, Our Time is Now, The End of Ice, Begin Again, No Justice in the Shadows, This Changes Everything, Drawing the Vote, Unrigged, Good Talk, Give Us the Ballot, Why We're Polarized, and Push Out. Black text on a white background, live from NYPL, election edition. Tuesday, October 13th at 8 p.m. EDT. All We Can Save. Women at the Forefront of Climate Justice. Scientists, activists, journalists, and artists summon truth, courage, and solutions for the climate crisis. Featuring Camille Dungy, Rihanna Gunwright, Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, Sarah Stillman, and Jane Zelikova. Thursday, October 15th at 7 p.m. EDT. Political Roundtable with the New York Review of Books. Contributors to the New York Review of Books examine and debate our moment of political division and crisis. Featuring Jamel Bowie, Pamela Carlin, Mark Lilla, Timothy Snyder, and Brenda Wineapple. For more information and to register, visit nypl.org slash live. Well, hi everyone and welcome to Live from NYPL. I'm Faye Rosenfeld and I am the Vice President of Public Programs at the New York Public Library. Tonight, we are very honored to present a conversation with four distinguished journalists, Len Downey, Judy Woodruff, Kevin Merida, and Elizabeth Green. They are here to discuss Len's newest book, All About the Story, News, Power, Politics, and the Washington Post and to discuss a subject that could not be more relevant or important, the role of American journalism and the search for truth in these perilous times. Len is the former executive editor of the Washington Post, a position he held from 1991 to 2008. He began his career at the Post as an intern and went on to spend nearly five decades at that august institution, helping to craft virtually every major story covered by the Post from Watergate to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and more, as I'm sure we'll hear. He also led the paper during a critical period of transition from the golden age of print into the digital age. During his tenure as executive editor, the Post won no fewer than 25 Pulitzer Prizes. All About the Story is his seventh book. Kevin Merida is also a former Washington Post reporter and editor. 
He spent a total of 22 years at the Post, serving as a congressional correspondent, political reporter, magazine columnist, national editor, and managing editor. Since 2015, he has been at ESPN, where he is the senior vice president and editor-in-chief of The Undefeated, a digital platform that explores the intersections of race, sports, and culture. Elizabeth Green is the CEO and co-founder of Chalkbeat, a nonprofit news organization that is focused on improving, edu improving educational equity through high impact independent local journalism. Founded in 2014, Chalkbeat has become within that relatively short period of time an indispensable source of information and insight for parents, teachers, and anyone who cares about our education system. And to moderate tonight's conversation, we are so honored to have one of our greatest political journalists and someone with a lot of experience as a moderator, Judy Woodruff. As we all know, Judy is the anchor and managing editor of PBS NewsHour. Among her many, many awards and accolades, I am very proud to say that she is also the recipient of the New York Public Library's Helen A. Bernstein Award for Excellence in Journalism. In just a moment, I will bring all our fabulous speakers onto the screen. Um, before I do that, I just have a couple of housekeeping notes. First, uh, All About the Story is available for purchase online from the library shop. You can find a link to purchase the book in, uh, in the Zoom and the YouTube chat, or you can just go to nypl.org slash shop. All purchases made at our shop do benefit the NYPL. Second, uh, I need to tell you that this conversation is being recorded. That is to say, I am being recorded, the speakers are being recorded, none of you are being recorded. Third, our panelists will take your questions. You can send a question at any time during the conversation uh, by typing it into the uh, bottom of the Zoom app, the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom app, or into the YouTube chat, or you can also email your questions to publicprograms at nypl.org. We will make sure that the speakers get your questions and they will answer as many as they can at the end of the program. Finally, I want to invite you to join us again next week on Thursday, on Tuesday, excuse me, October 13th, climate scientist, Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, New Yorker staff writer, Sarah Stillman, poet Camille Dungy and others will be with us for a conversation about All You Can Change, which is a brilliant new collection of essays and poems by and about women at the forefront of the movement for climate justice. And on October 15th, uh, which may or may not be the night of our next presidential debate, who knows, Jamel Bowie, Pamela Carlin, Timothy Snyder, Mark Lilla, and Brenda Wineapple will join us for a joint New York Review of Books slash New York Public Library political roundtable. You can go to nypl.org slash live for more information and to register. We look forward to having you with us virtually for these and many of our other upcoming events. And please don't forget that many of our branches are now open for grab and go service. So please go visit your local branch, say hello to your local librarians and check out some books. Now, please welcome Len Downey, Kevin Merida, Elizabeth Green and Judy Woodruff. Hello to all of you. Thank you, Faye, for that wonderful introduction. I'm so glad to be here, so honored to be with all of you, and just so pleased to be here with my good friend, uh, Len Downey, who's written this book. I'm going to hold up, hold it up so I, everybody can see what it looks like when you go to your bookstore or you go online to order it, and to be, of course, here with Kevin Merida and with Elizabeth Green. It's such a treat, and the subject couldn't be more important. We're here to talk about journalism uh, captured brilliantly and personally in this book, uh, seventh book by, uh, by Lynn. Lynn, I am gonna start with you because mm -hmm. you, I look at your career, you started in 1964 at the Washington Post, uh, really well before Watergate. We think of the Watergate being the beginning of the Post era, but you were there before that. You covered Washington in the 60s through Watergate. You were a foreign correspondent for a while. You were based in London, you covered Northern Ireland. You were back in Washington for the Clinton impeachment, and I'm jumping over a whole lot, 9-11 uh, and so on, leaving in 2008. I guess my question, first question for you is there's so many wonderful stories in this book. What were your 44 years at the Washington Post, the glory days of journalism? Um, and whether they were or they weren't, just tell us, give us a sense of one of your favorite episodes from this book. I should say that I, I, as I say in the book, it was the golden age for newspapers, when newspapers were a dominant form of, of uh, news media in the United States. There were only three broadcast networks. Uh, most cities had at least one newspaper and, uh, and they had large circulations. 
And uh, that was before the internet. And a lot of that has changed as we may want to talk about later. I, I would say, obviously, being one of the editors on Watergate, uh, supervising that coverage uh, uh, for the uh, final months before uh, Nixon's uh, resignation was certainly one of the most important things that I was able to do as a journalist. It was, uh, it was not glamorous at the time, despite the movie that came out later, uh, because we were all alone in that story for quite a long time. Uh, and the Nixon administration was very high hostile to the Washington Post and to, a, and to the Watergate coverage, uh, not unlike some of the things we've seen in the current administration. Uh, and so, uh, but that, that was certainly very important. I would say that uh, uh, the, the most important decision I had to make, the most difficult decision I had to make was after 9-11, the, after uh, during the CIA's covert war against terrorism, when a brilliant reporter at the Washington Post named Dana Priest pieced together, this was not a, not a leak, not, not, nothing like that. She pieced it together carefully in her reporting in the intelligence community that the CIA was operating secret prisons in Eastern European countries where we found out later uh, uh, terrorist suspects are being tortured. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the head of the CIA, the, the director of national intelligence, and then ultimately President Bush himself during a meeting in the Oval Office uh, tried to talk us out of running that story. And I had to make a decision about whether or not we should run that story and whether or not it, was, it would do any harm to national security beyond what actually happened, which is they had to shut down those secret prisons, bring those prisoners back within the American legal system and treat them properly. I have two more quick questions I want to ask you before I turn uh, to Kevin and Elizabeth. One is, what's the common thread that runs through your career, both inside you as a reporter and the reporters you supervised or you edited, that made them the great journalists, the great reporters that they were? That's number one. Well, I adopted Ben Bradley's theory, which is uh, hire lots of people a lot smarter than you are and enable them to do their best work. Uh, and uh, I, I was a hands-on editor. I was all over the newsroom. Kevin can tell you that. I'd pop up wherever he was in the newsroom every now and then and see what he's doing and kibitz about what he's doing. Uh, and uh, I, and, and I, I, I wanted a newsroom in which, as I told everybody who worked for us, in which anybody, all of those talented people, any one of those talented people that had something really important to put in the newspaper so, or, or, or were concerned about a decision we were making about the news newspaper, they, 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 they should come to me. Uh, and uh, uh, so that when I was making difficult decisions, I had a lot of really good advice for those talented people in the newsroom. And, and, uh, and they knew that they could take their own initiative at any time. Uh, and it, it came from the bottom up. It, you know, we did not dictate what the, what the coverage was going to be from the top down. All right. And then my next question goes back to, to Watergate. And, and it, it is going to, I think, lead us into a, uh, the conversation we're going to be having throughout our time together tonight. But if, if, Watergate had happened, if, if back in the day of Watergate, you had had cable news, Fox News, digital, um, social yeah. media, um, if you had the, the landscape that you have today, what would have been different? Everything would have been different. Uh, I, I can't imagine how it would have actually worked. I would assume that the Nixon administration's friends in the news media, if they would have had friends in the news media of the kind that there now are uh, on the on the right wing of the news media, for example, uh, would have been uh, you know uh, shooting holes in the story, trying to distract from the story. Uh, 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 new things would have been popping up all over the internet. We were absolutely alone in this story until the end of 1972 because because the Washington Post wasn't circulated nationally. And it was Walter Cronkite, who at the very end of October in 1972, uh, devoted half of his news show, something would be unheard of today, half of his news show to Watergate uh, and to call Americans' attention to what the Washington Post was doing, literally holding up our front pages uh, in, front of the, in front of the camera. Uh, and then that, that, that interested the rest of the media in it. Uh, but but it, we're still, it was still a relatively small group of reporters uh, from, uh, from various news media who were working on that story. Uh, and, and didn't have the ca cacophony of all the different voices you'd find now on the internet. So many great stories from this book and I'm encouraging and throughout this conversation, I'm gonna encourage everybody to read it. I'm gonna jump to you, Elizabeth, because we're thinking about this big newspaper, big influential, became a national paper. And there are, you know, there are what, a handful of national newspapers today, the Times, the Post, the Wall Street Journal, that are influential, that are seem to be doing pretty well. Um, meanwhile, we worry a lot about local news, and yet you have 
thrown yourself into something that is very local and very niche in a way. It's education. What made you think that something like what you're doing could thrive uh, in this otherwise uh, tumultuous big media atmosphere? Ooh, um, well, you know, I what I really wanted to do was work for each of the three of you. And maybe one day if I was lucky enough to become each of the three of you, that was my <laughs> goal. But I entered this profession um, at, in it was 2006 that I entered the profession. And so that was the beginning of what's been become, um, I guess now more than um, 10, more than 10 years of a real steep downturn. And so the, the path that uh, journalists like me could follow just didn't exist. I mean, the, the path that I wanted to follow didn't exist. And also the path that I thought was important didn't exist. So I was lucky to be able to work at a local newspaper covering public education before that newspaper was folded in the financial crisis. And I, I knew viscerally that these stories made a big difference, a tremendous difference. Like you write about in your book, Len, you're the beginning of your career covering the DC city council um, and the DC courts. Um, and uh, you know the, the DC court system was completely overhauled because of your reporting. So, so I knew that public schools was one place where light needed to be shined um, and reporting could make enormous difference. And I, the reason that we're structured the way we are at Chalkbeat is to make a sustainable and durable model that operates effectively in this new media climate. Um, it, it looks different than the traditional things that came before, um, but it, in many ways it does very similar work for our democracy. And Elizabeth, as you look around at other local um, news ventures, local, that are locally based, do they seem to be doing well? Do they seem to be catching on? How hard is it? Oh, it's, it, I mean, the devastation that this profession has seen and the, the consequences for, for all of us are so severe. Um, we've lost, by the end of this decade, we, or by the end of the decade that just completed, we lost two thirds of newsroom jobs in this country. Um, more jobs by percentage than the coal mining profession. Um, we, we're just in an absolute um, devastating time for local news. And what that means is that even the outlets that have tried to make a go of it and said, we'll do something new on the internet. Um, it'll be different than the traditional business model. Many of them have folded. And so to me, the, the future has to look really different than what the past looked like. It has to be nonprofit. The model can't be the same single, single place, many topic model, right? That's why Chalkbeat is many places, one topic. Um, and I'm hopeful though, I'm very hopeful that we can uh, really take the momentum of um, the, the early interest of and the early success of organizations like Chalkbeat and, and, and build a whole new local news system. Um, so, so that, and that's, that's what I'm throwing myself into, like you said. Well, it's very exciting to see, to watch what you've done in, in a short period of time. Yeah. Kevin Merida. There you were, what was it, uh, five years ago, very successful guy, editor at the uh, Washington Post. You've worked with some phenomenal people like Len Downey, um, and you gave all that up to go over to ESPN uh, and work in sports, and you talk about the intersection of sports and race and culture, to work in investigative. A lot of it is digital, as we know. Um, is this more... Is, is this what you thought it was going to be? Is this satisfying? What does it bring you? Well, it, it, it's extremely satisfying, but, but um, you know, I, I gave up, when I left the post, it was, it was the most difficult decision of my, my career. And I, you know, had been there, as was said, 22 years, and I was managing editor. So usually I was trying to keep people from leaving. <laughs> and all of a sudden people were coming to my office trying to keep me from leaving. It was a really <laughs> surreal experience. But part of it was just, you know, this age that we're in, and it's an age of disruption, you know, it, it we, we are still in the, the midst of a, a technological revolution, and, and we're creating new ways to reach uh, audiences, they're consuming, consumption habits are different. Um, and it's really, uh, we were part of that, the Washington Post, I was part of that, 
uh, change into a really digital first uh, newsroom. And, and part of what we were creating there, you know, you could see that that was exciting, that as a result of Jeff Bezos investing it in, into it and, and, and coming in and spending money to, uh, on the editorial product. And I thought, let me see if I could essentially create a startup inside of a big company. And, uh, and that was a, an exciting thing. I think when we first started this, I remember as journalists, you know, we, we used to, to, to frown on the word content, you know, we thought that that was like the antithesis that there, there was something bad to, to even call content, but actually it's an expansive term, you know, and there are so many content creators out and, and people are, are getting information and learning things in new and exciting ways. I mean, and, and, and one of the things that we have done at, at, um, with the undefeated at ESPN, we essentially created a, a content studio inside of ESPN where we do long form journalism and commentary and essays and news, but we, we produce two best-selling children's books. We, we've done six music videos. We're about to release an album. And, and with a run up to the election where we are essentially doing covers of three protest songs. And we're in this age of, of activism and protest, and we're doing songs such as uh, remakes of songs such as Strange Fruit, which was initially recorded by Billie Holiday in 1939 as a protest against Black Americans being lynched. And, and Marvin Gaye's Mercy, Mercy Me, which was one of the first R&B singers to do uh, uh, a song about um, environmental issues. Um, and, and a new song by a hip hop artist Rhapsody uh, about these times, you know, uh, and, and policing. And so these are different ways to reach audiences, young people who are coming, you know, when you talk about a, a forerunner to voting, you know, we can give them investigative reporting, which we still should, uh, and commentary, but now we can surround uh, the, the kind of landscape with different forms. And, and that's a really important development, I think, uh, that extends journalism. I want to pick up on something you said and sort of jump and jump to that. And that um, it has to do with something I think journalism has not done very well. And that is um, looking like the country we cover. Um, you, I mean, you're in charge of what you do there, but as you look around at the major news organization in this country, we don't have many uh, individuals of color who are black men or women running newsrooms. Dean Baquet at the New York Times is the exception. Uh, we don't have that many black reporters covering, we have a few covering the White House, the Michelle Sender with the News Hour. There's certainly others at the White House uh, covering uh, the Pentagon, the State Department, so on. But why have we not done better in that department? Well, I, I think we, I think it's will, right? I, I think some of it, explains itself that I, I do believe that that diversity and inclusion have become values by the best places and, and editors but but the question is where does this sit on the value spectrum you know is it is it ever number one you know is it is it does it have the urgency like right now the conversations we've been having in the aftermath of George Floyd they feel urgency in every newsroom and and beyond and every corporate space and and we know that that government laws and you know reporting has helped to change laws. Certainly, civil rights movement helped to create laws. But but we know that a lot of America's run uh, in the biggest corporations. That's where a lot of the power to drive change. And and we're seeing conversations now, both in media companies and elsewhere, that are really kind of uh, there is a reckoning inside these places. And and some of that has spilled out. And we, you know, out on social media and in the news media, but, but that's a really good development because uh, I think until you really have um, people of color running things, making the final decisions, um, that's when, when you get the kind of change that you really need and you get the kind of newsrooms that, that you really need. I know we've felt that way about women, and, but, for so, but for the longest time, as you say, people of color haven't been given that opportunity. Lynn, what do you think about that? I mean, as somebody who was running a newsroom, running an organization, what, why has it taken so long? Why is it still not happening? Uh, first of all, this was one of my 
big priorities at the Washington Post, as Kevin knows. Uh, uh, even though the Post was one of the first newspapers in the country to hire African-American journalists at all, uh, the numbers were still relatively small. There were questions about pay discrepancies. Uh, women also felt that they didn't have the best assignments uh, and there were pay discrepancies there. And so when I became executive editor working with Don Graham, uh, my, my, my publisher, uh, they, this was one of our top priorities. Uh, was to was to deal with uh, pay discrepancies throughout the newsroom, to increase the numbers of women and uh, journalists of color throughout the newsroom and in positions of responsibility. When I left, we were nearly 50% women. We were 25% journalists of color. And the top 40 editors of newspaper when I left were, were majority women and journalists of color. Uh, and uh, um, I, I, we, we, were, we were fortunate to have a large staff, fortunate to have a publisher for whom this was an important value, uh, fortunate to have staff members who had these, had these values. Uh, and, but we, uh, we, we devoted most of our editor's retreats, uh, much of our editor's retreats to this subject. We had two different commissions on diversity, making recommendations that I carried out in the newsroom. It was frequently the, 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 the stuff of staff meetings. One of the things I think was we became a newsroom that was not afraid to deal with this issue. Uh, I think to, to, uh, to some extent, uh, the uh, uh, newsrooms are traditionally top down. I like to make the joke that a few of the uh, one of the uh, a few uh, uh, legal dictatorships in the United States is a newsroom <laughs> run by by a single person, the executive editor, uh, and hierarchy of editors underneath that person. It's necessary because of decisions you have to make every minute and every day in a newsroom. But it also means that there's this, there, there can be threats uh, to that structure uh, when there are when there are problems that need to be addressed. And and uh, as, as Kevin said, I, I think that uh, now more than ever, uh, this is a subject that newsrooms are tackling. I know the Washington Post just appointed a managing editor for diversity. Where I teach uh, the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University, uh, this is a subject for all students and faculty and administrators for this entire year is a project for the future of the school in terms of diversity. Well, speaking of what you said about dictatorships in the newsroom, <laughs> how, how are the young people coming into journalism today? And of course, you're at a journalism school now, but how, how do they seem different to you, Len, than they did when you started at the Post, when you were one of them, 40 uh, some years? Well, yeah, when I was one of them, uh, first of all, the staffs were very large. Uh, entry was much easier than it is now. Uh, I was a kind of accidental summer intern at the Washington Post. I don't think I would have been able to do that now. Uh, uh, and and, uh, and, and our, our, our skills were reporting and writing. That was about it. And in fact, uh, some, some journalists only reported and other people did the writing. Uh, nowadays, uh, they, everybody has, has to be very multi-skilled. The students I'm teaching now can shoot video. They can take photographs. Uh, they can do podcasts. Uh, and, and they can report and write. They have to be able to do all those things. And the jobs that they're, they're going to be competing for, many of them are newly created jobs that do those things, that don't do the things that Kevin and I first did when we grew up. Uh, and, and, you know, Kev, Kevin's one of the uh, one of the leading lights of somebody who's somewhat mature, who's been learning, who's been learning new skills, learning new things to do, new tricks. Uh, so, uh, so actually, a lot of these younger people have that have that advantage. However, at the same time, as I tell them, they really have to treat it as a mission because it is an around the clock demanding job. Uh, and if you're not prepared for that, you're not going to be able to succeed uh, because there's just so much to do now and the demands are so high. Elizabeth, you are one of those younger younger journalists, even though I think you, you tried to suggest a few minutes ago you've been doing this for, for many years. Um, how do you, what is your sense of, of your generation and even the younger generation, the, the reporters who work for you, work with you, who you deal with, and what their expectation of journalism and how that's different? Hmm. Who, I, um, I was trying to do the math accurately and remember actually what year we are actually living in, which is hard to keep track of these days, but I have been um, doing this for, for a while. And so it is a difference. I think if you came into to journalism at a time when there were legacy institutions were still relatively strong versus you come in and you're really making such a gamble entering journalism um, when, when there's very, very few jobs of meaning. And I think many people have observed that 
um, the most mean, the, the best paid jobs to enter in are not the ones that are going to be going to the, to the DC court system and interviewing all of the judges off the record and finding that there was corruption there. That is a, a luxurious position to be in that unfortunately we don't find reporters in and you're much more likely to be managing a social media account for a major brand that may be doing sponsored content. And so um, that said, I mean, we are absolutely still seeing people, young people who are committed to the mission of journalism, absolutely. And what they really want to do is be Len Downey and go into the DC courts and find corruption. And so I think there's um, no you know, shortage of, of really talented people. Part of the reason I'm asking you, Elizabeth, and I, and uh, is is because we do have this sense that, anecdotally, that a lot of young journalists want to do opinion before they do reporting. That they come in with a point of view, and they think it's the old fogies who are still out there worried about um, the old-fashioned kind of fact-based journalism. How do you see that? I don't. I mean, I, I haven't experienced that personally. I have experienced a lot of. Um, reporters who are really determined to, to learn the, the basic skills of beat reporting, of source development, of, um, you know, fact checking and understanding how to explain research. I do think that there is in the baton pass of gener that is a major baton pass happening in every element of society right now. I think we're at a generational seismic shift. Um, I do think there is a, a critique uh, among my generation, especially journalists of color, especially um, journalists who weren't included at, at, in the ranks of the decision makers. Um, there is a feeling that some of the traditions that were called objective maybe actually weren't so objective. And so um, I personally don't see that as an argument for opinion writing um, or against uh, really the, the traditional journalism that I aspire to. I see it as just sort of pushing on legacy institutions to be uh, more honest in their truth telling, calling lies lies more boldly, calling racism racism more boldly. Um, but I don't personally see that as a, as a push to opinion writing. There, there certainly is a live debate about this though. That's, that's my view. There sure is. Um, Kevin, how do you see that shift? Um, that Elizabeth's describing and connect it to, frankly, to, to President Trump. And um, I mean, we're clearly more polarized as a country. The public seems to be, um, they look to the media, to the mainstream media, and we disappoint them if they're not, you know, if they're on the right or the left, we're not sufficiently wherever they are. But how do you see his effect on journalism? And this is kind of a big question but connect it to what Elizabeth was saying about the younger generation looking to our generation and saying, you guys didn't always, you weren't straight all the time. Well, well, the, the first thing I wanted to say was, was just that the talent that's out there now, no, no one should underestimate how strong the talent is. The, the young kids today are every bit as talented as when I was first coming up and I, Thought I was our generation's great. And I'm sure Lynn is that the, the talent is just tremendous. And and I think one of the great things about and and this also is why we're struggling a little bit in the craft is that it's one of the first times where young people, because they have grown up in this digital era and they have some some native abilities and some skills and and competencies, they're coming together with experienced journals in the same newsroom. You know. The place that the place like the Washington Post, the median age now, there are people getting jobs that they never would have been able to get of influence and power in these places. And so you're getting some of this generational tension and, and clashing. And, and, and one of the things, and I think it's a good thing because you're you're getting this thing where the, the, the journals who have been around are learning things because learning new things and they are also teaching. And, and I think that when it works right, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic time in our, in, our, in our craft. But the tension point, I think, is some of it is just personal habit. I think that a, a lot of the young people coming up do not believe that you need to have this separation from every single thing you do in your personal life with your work. And I think that's one of the big things. They, they do believe that you, you don't have to divorce yourself. 
you know, we, we, we started, and Lynn can speak on this well, and his book is a, a testament to that. I mean, Lynn, as is famous, didn't, didn't vote, and there are a lot of really kind of guidelines and rules, and we see this constantly butting up against, particularly on social media, where, where a, a lot of people come at the day believe that they can express viewpoints on social. They believe that that, that is not a deterrent to their ability to then go out and report on news, that they don't believe there's a conflict. And, and whether or not there is this appearance of lack of objectivity, they believe that you can point to things and you can still go out and do your job. And I think that's one of the, the fundamental tensions. Um, you know, and that, and that speaks also to this era of, of, of Trump. Trump is just, um, I think, just a, a kind of signifier of the divisions in the country, you know, and, and because he's the president, He's the biggest signifier, right? And so I think that that we're seeing all this, the divisions that exist in the country, irrespective of who's at the top of the of the offices, are playing out now, um, and and through the prism of of the election and and this particular presidency. Lynn, pick up on that. I mean, how do you see President Trump and his um, what he's not only said about the press, but what he represents for the press, this not this news machine, basically. Um, what that, what that, how that fits at this moment when journalism is going through the turmoil and upheaval that it that it is. Well, as I, I wrote in a in a report for the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, no president has ever, at least in our modern times, has ever attacked uh, news and attacked facts the way this president has. Uh, and that is a that that is a big challenge uh, to the news media uh, because it's difficult to to operate when you're being personally attacked as many journalists are. But public rallies and the president's you know sicking mobs on journalists uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and and uh, and 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 taking account of I, I, I my whole life has been devoted to investigative reporting in one form or another when I was doing it and then when I was directing it at the Washington Post and I. It started with Watergate, and, and, I, I, and it's a very important part of American journalism, holding people in power accountable to the rest of us. And he simply does not want that to happen and is, and is attacking that kind of journalism all the time. Uh, the, the interesting uh, uh, impact of that, though, is, is that journalists have taken up that challenge, you know, not as Democrats, not as, not as anti-Trump. But, but they, they feel a greater responsibility than ever to hold this government accountable and are doing fantastic investigative reporting. It's the, it's the, mission, it's the mission of much of American journalism now. But how do you, I guess I'm gonna ask you and Elizabeth, I mean, how do you square that? I mean, where does um, the ability to do good reporting Where's that line between being not, I don't use the word objective because I don't think it's possible to be truly objective. I mean, all I can do is try as fair as I can. But that line between trying to do that and, and also having personal opinions. And as Kevin said, the younger generation, maybe I just turn to you right now on this, Elizabeth, feeling that it's okay to say on Twitter what you think, but you can still be uh, a fair reporter and cover the story. Well, I'll, let me speak first yeah, and yeah, speak for that generation. Uh, we, we, really, we boxed you into a generation, Elizabeth, I apologize. Uh, so uh, I, I do believe in, in, key, in keeping your personal opinions. Uh, you know, ideally, I think you shouldn't have personal opinions about a lot of things. And, and that, you know, Black Lives Matter is not a personal opinion. That's a fact. And so I think there's been confusion between expressing facts on social media, facts in your reporting, and personal opinions. You know, who should be president of the United States? That's a personal opinion, as opposed to holding whoever is president accountable. And and uh, you know, Bill and Hillary Clinton personally hated me for the reporting the Washington Post did about them. So I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not on one side or the other. And I did not vote the whole time that I wrote, uh, uh, ran the newspaper. But I didn't think reporters shouldn't vote. Uh, but so it's 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 important if you're going to exercise. Your, your rights under the First Amendment to, to be very aggressive in your reporting, in your public reporting, I think you should try to keep personal opinion out of it. What about that, Elizabeth? Um, you, you, did, you don't think reporters should vote either. 
Or you no, do? I, uh, I, no, I, no, I, I, sorry. I, I, in fact, I've been asked that question. In fact, I've just written a piece about it for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, uh, no, I, I, you know, I would prefer the reporters to cover politics, not vote. But if they, if they must, they must. But it, it, during my time at the Post and continuing to today, uh, every other political activity by Post journalists is, is, for, is forbidden. You can't work in political campaigns. You can't contribute to candidates. You can't contribute to causes. You can't sign petitions. You can't march in demonstrations. That does mean that Post journalists do give up some of their rights as citizens in order to collectively exercise their incredibly powerful right under the First Amendment to hold the government accountable. Yeah. Well, I don't want to scare anyone, but speaking for my generation, I don't vote either in races that I cover, or direct the coverage of. Um, uh, I, I just meant, don't worry, I'm sure my generation is, is voting in this election. Um, but I, 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 I agree with you. I, I love the Len Downey School of Thought. I don't think that education reporters in the ideal world are voting in a school board election that they're covering or a mayoral election if there's mayoral control of schools because I agree that that in my experience as a reporter it makes it harder for me to cover a story fairly if I'm invested in in a candidate or a way of looking at it and and I would say on on in you know the people that I work with who are young um, are a, a very diverse set of views on this. And sometimes in our newsroom, we've had a lot of difficult conversations about, you know, because we're new, we're building something new. We have no tradition to turn to. We have to write our whole political participation policy from scratch, just blank Google document and Elizabeth, ah, what do I type? And, um, you know, what, what the feedback we hear is, is not what I would expect a lot of the time. So some of the some of the youngest reporters on our team are the staunchest against us ever even inching toward a line of of political participation. And some of the reporters of color on our team um, from marginalized communities even more so, saying, you know, I I'm already looked at as uh, somebody a little bit suspect, and I want to protect my um, reputational integrity um, even more than anyone else because I know that sources are not going to to trust me as much because I'm not the way they're used to the person they're used to working with. Um, so I think there's a diversity of views, um, and I don't think it's it's so simple. And I and I do also think we're living in a crazy time, <laughs> crazy time where it's really hard to. Um, to hold to hold your tongue about values. I wouldn't call it facts. I would say values. Um, and so that's been the line that we've drawn at Chalkbeat is reporters and news organizations should be really transparent about their values. And when those values are crossed, it's okay to, to say something about that. Well, crazy time for sure. And by the way, I do think reporters, I, I guess I disagree with Lynn. I think it's okay to be able to vote because I don't want to give up you know, my rights as a citizen, but to try really hard to keep it separate. But I know that's that's a whole other discussion. Kevin, Kevin, let's come back, though, to the Trump era and what's happened to um, an attempt by journalism to set the record straight. Do we use the word lie? Do we use the word inaccurate? I mean, how do we how do we wrestle with that? I mean, I have a, a philosophy about it, but what what do you think? You know, I, I, I guess I don't get too too much into the, the whether or not you, you the, the specific words. We're, we're constantly making word choices anyway. Um, and we're also trying to reach people, you know. Um, and it, it, I think the most thing is rigor. You know, that's that's the word that I want, you know, that that you bring the journalism. The journalism speaks for itself. If, if you're rigorous about it, uh, as, as Lynn says, holding the administration accountable, um, being relentless about uh, the things that uh, a president says and, and an administration does. Uh, you know, the fact checking industry has been a good, a good industry that's grown up inside of journal. I, I was there when the fact checker that currently is there helped create that. You know, you know Glenn Kessler, if he's listening, he didn't want to do it at first. And, and I told him this is a very important function to use his skills and they, they built it up. And it's been a very good thing for to to have that right um, and it's and, and lots of other news organizations but the kind of reporting it, it this is the time when it it demonstrates that reporting really matters you know and that there is a place for going out and and finding out things that that people don't want you to know and informing the public of them 
and and I you know I generally trust the public with if we present our work right, if we have it nailed down uh, and rigorous about our documentation, that people do come to that work. Um, and 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 yeah, we're always we're in this time where there is such a the proliferation of quote unquote content out there that that people are drawn to things that that reinforce their worldview and their opinion. And so you're always contending with that. But there is a body of the population that wants to know, they, they, they're open to what you tell them if you bring it in and, and you, you present it with the kind of, of rigor that, that a lot of the places that we've worked at um, are, are doing. Um, so many, I think we've got about three or four minutes before we take questions from our, our, uh, our audience participants. Um, Lynn, how much does it matter that we repair at least some of the distrust that's built up toward the news media in this recent era? I think it's extremely important. Uh, I would hope that whenever we have a different president, whether it's now or four years from now, uh, that that will help. Uh, that this relentless attacks on the on the credibility of the media will 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 will, will recede, and that will help a lot. It's also important for the media to be transparent. It's one of the reasons I wrote this book is to show people how journalism is really done on the inside. We're not very we have not been very good about showing showing our work as they used to say back in school, uh, uh, and uh, you know sh showing showing the showing all the math that went behind the final answer. Uh, and so that's why I tried to show, I, again, including the mistakes, mistakes that I made, mistakes the Post made are in that book, uh, and uh, why we do what we do, what our values are. To be more transparent about what we do, I think, would help a lot. There's also something in the country now called the news literacy movement, where uh, uh, the, the teaching children in school, teaching college students, uh, doing things for the general public to help them understand how the media really works and, uh, and how to evaluate uh, fact-finding journalism, truth-seeking journalism from other things that are available on the internet. Okay, only about two minutes before we take questions from the audience, but Elizabeth, do you, do you bump into that public distrust of what you're reporting or is it different because your main focus is education? I do think it's different. I think, I mean, we see in the surveys that local news is among the most trusted, um, along with public media, of the most trusted uh, brands and news. And I think um, that shows up for us. I also think some of the, the new work that, that yes, um, my generation is, is leading, I would say proudly is to really um, invest in engaging new communities who weren't engaged in the work in the journalism all, all along the way through the process. And so, you know, our Bureau, bureau in Newark, New Jersey, um, for example, we heard from the black community there in particular, nobody's ever asked us what stories do you want to read about? Nobody's ever treated us as the reader um, at, at, the, at the mainstream media. But now that, that we have gone out and asked that, those questions, there, that does build a lot more trust. And, and Kevin, you wanna tackle that? How much distrust do you run into? I mean, in somebody who's, I mean, your focus, as we said at ESPN, is the intersection of sports, race, culture, so much more. Well, I, I you know, look, every everybody is distrustful, you, even athletes, right? They're famous, and, and sometimes they don't have this trust that they will be, you know, uh, that their lives outside of, of the fields and courts will be properly rendered, right? That they are, that they are bigger than just simply, you know, entertainment for people who fill the arenas and stadiums. And so, you know, we, we have to work hard for that, you know, and, and, I, and I think that, that it's important to, to really do work that hasn't been done and, and to engage a community. I mean, one of the things we, we've done a lot is the town halls when we could back to do them. We, we, we went out and, and, and one of the first things we did, we went to the South side of Chicago uh, and had a, a town hall on gun violence and brought athletes and community leaders together and people thanked us for it. They said it had never been done. And so I do think that that's an important function beyond what we put in our work to, to be present to, in a lot of what Lynn is saying, the, the transparency of his book, which is tremendous, um, it, it's about letting people see who we are too. And I think that helps us, uh, helps our craft. 
Okay, we have some questions, uh, several of them standing by, and I'm going to I'm just going to read them. You'll see me squinting a little bit trying to read them. They're over to the side in the chat area. I'm going to put this one to you, Lynn. What are the mainstream major news organizations, quote, this person says, of fact, doing to convince those who, quote, only get their news from social media that a fact is a fact? Is the paid subscription model actually preventing you, us, from building an audience of believers in your content? Uh, The paid subscription model has been terrific for a lot of the large newspapers, the Washington Post and New York Times. They're not really newspapers anymore. They're multimedia uh, uh, news organizations that also put out a newspaper uh, each day. Uh, and uh, they're, they, they're, they're surrounding people with their information. Uh, and uh, and uh, you don't have to, get, you don't have to get, uh, necessarily have a subscription in order to benefit from the news that they're uh, uh, disseminating uh, to audiences in, uh, in, in many different ways. Uh, so I, 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 but as I, I came back to what I think before is we, we need to, they need to explain themselves. They need to help people understand how, how they do their work. Uh, so that people will 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 understand that. And Lynn, here's a question I should have asked you first, but this is off the book. It, it, it says um, you once called yourself the anti <laughs> Ben Bradley, uh, where Ben was a Harvard grad, had an impeccable lineage, was well connected, whereas you were not. Right. Um, good boy from Cleveland. Uh, makes right. It. Um, um, do you think that helped, or do you think it hurt your career, or both? And this person says, "Thank you, Mr. Down. A great book for any would-be journalist." Well, thanks. Very kind. Uh, it, I, it was. It was it, neither. I mean, that, that's one of the wonderful things about the Washington Post is that it it, it changed. When I first went there, uh, there were mostly Ivy Leaguers and Eastern League, you know, journalists. In fact, because I I was one of the only two people to come from a state university at that time in the newsroom, I was called Land Grant Lynn for a while by one of my Harvard graduate friends who sat next to me, uh, and and. and became known that in the newsroom. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Ben was wonderful for what Ben was. Uh, and uh, and t- together we, we, we complimented each other. So that I made sure, for instance, after I became executive editor, that each one of my managing editors was different from me, uh, quite different from me. They had different, had strengths where I had weaknesses. Uh, and uh, so uh, it, it, it worked out. Now, I, I do have questions about whether maybe some newsroom to the north of us uh, maybe might have been more difficult uh, for somebody with my background to succeed. That's possible uh, because the Post was such an open place. I mean, you know, ben, and, ben, ben created this very open newsroom where anybody could succeed uh, and, uh, and, and, and including me. I wonder what newspaper you're referring to up north. Um, I'm going to put this one uh, to you, Kevin. Many of the European democracies have state-funded media that do extremely well-respected, transparent journalism for its citizens. Stations like Deutsche Welle, the BBC, the Canadian Broadcast Channel, to name a few, they get the majority of their funding from insulated government sources. Do you think a similar system could be successful in the United States? No. No. Uh, you know, because I think that part of what we, there, there is a desire to, you know, to be able to be a check and balance on government, to be able to, to, to represent the, the, the people's interests, right? And, and I just think that we wouldn't want to have that compromise. You know, uh, I, I, I'm more likely, I think, as, as Elizabeth knows, the, the nonprofit model, and I do think that there are other sources of, uh, of funding. And, th- and that is a big issue, figuring out how to create the work we, at, at a time when a lot of local places that were really formerly great we, in the newspaper era are, are gone, we still need state governments to be, um, you know, covered and, and local governments. And, and too much of that is, is going unchecked. And so uh, I don't think that that will work government funding, no. Elizabeth, what do you think about that? Well, I think we're going to have to be open to it if we're going to have a check on government. And so the question is, how could we do it? It's interesting in the state of New Jersey, there are some of the most significant news deserts, although that's a really a contest that's a race to the bottom, which state has the worst news deserts. But New Jersey is really, really bad. And uh, New Jersey state legislature passed legislation to provide some state 
financing of journalism. And so that's an interesting, small, but interesting early experiment in what could be that, that I'm in favor of let's try things. Um, as someone who with PBS, where there is some federal funding that finds its way uh, in a very circuitous way, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and so on. And then it actually goes to local PBS stations who then pay part of, pay for part of the programming they get from PBS. So we get it very indirectly, but it is a chunk of what, of what supports us. But I'm happy to say that we uh, continue to work on individual contributions, on corporate contributions, on um, nonprofit contributions. That those but not like the European model that not at no, no, no. and that's what I'm not would... talking about. Yeah. Not talking about that. But I wanted to say that because it's PBS. Yeah. Well, um, if I can just add, when you yes, move, when Lynn, you move from Western Europe to Eastern Europe, you see the the, the problems with uh, with the excessive government financing because. They in fact are are, uh, are are buying up the press, uh, and uh, and the governments are controlling the press uh, through through. Uh, and we don't want to have that happen here. One thing I'll just add is that some of us nonprofit news organizations actually came together and created um, advocacy groups for the first time, and we're identifying some opportunities for new ways, like the PBS way, not like the. Right. Eastern European model to direct more public support to newsrooms. There's another question on diversity, which we covered. I'm trying to figure out if I can read it correctly, if this is, if this takes us beyond what we've already talked about. So you all can respond. This is, this was, the person says, what do you think the reason is for the lack of diversity in journalism? What defines a diverse newsroom versus a newsroom where diversity is lacking? How does an owner know if their newsroom is diverse? What's the standard? And maybe, Kevin, we broaden this out. We talk about racial diversity, gender diversity, but diversity, the kind that Len was just referring to. Not everybody's from an Ivy League school. Some people come from the middle of a flyover country, if you will. Um, you know, it, that, that kind of diversity matter, matters as well. Absolutely. I mean, I, th I think anytime we can can broaden the range of experience and make, makes us better internally with the discussions of what to pursue and how to pursue it, but, it, but it, it, it's able to connect. We, we often get the criticism, we don't have enough ideological conservatives in news, and we often get the presidents, we don't have enough really working class journalists. Um, I, I, I know I was drawn, when I was managing editor, there was somebody who applied who had been, whose background was, a, it wasn't really a, journal, a truck driver. And it, it really appealed to me, um, you know, in the same way that that giving opportunity to people who are really young that you don't expect. I, th I think I think we also have to hire on on potential more and and promise more and and really and be more proactive about seeking out people who are different than us, you know, and as, as Lynn mentioned, and I think that's going to make us better. Is Judy frozen? I think, yeah. Here she is. There you are. Oh, it's frozen again. Judy, you're muted. Judy, you're muted. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll speak for a little while. <laughs> well, for, for, first of all, Elizabeth, I'm really interested in with these advocacy groups you're talking about. Uh, I assume you don't mean political advocacy, you mean advocacy on behalf of, of uh, local journalism. How, how does that work? Yeah, well, you know, the newspaper owners have a have a an association that lobbies. Um, and so nonprofit news, um, we created our own um, coalition to look at, to actually know, to do like look at legislation and recommend legislation for how we might um, as a society pay for our news collectively in, so, in okay. at least in small ways. Um, and, and that's, yeah, it's, it's been a really fun thing to be involved in and super weird for a journalist to be involved in, as you can imagine. Right. I, I want to come back to, to, um, uh, the future of journalism. How do you all see it 
changing in the years to come. We get asked this question all the time. What do you worry about? What, what do you think is promising? And I'm going to, um, Len, I have to ask it. I mean, how much oxygen goes out of the room once President Trump leaves office, whether it's 2021 or 2025? Well, you know, that particular story will, uh, will drift away, but um, uh, the, uh, the divisions in the country are not going to go away. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you see these interviews on, on, on television, read them in newspapers uh, with people who believe very much what he believes, who believe uh, uh, things that are completely anti-factual. You know, that's, that's not going away. Uh, and, the, and, they're, they're, and, and particularly coming out of this terrible uh, pandemic and the terrible economic impact of this pandemic is going to leave a lot of people very much adrift, very angry, or very, very, very disturbed. Uh, and uh, and so uh, there's going to be there's a lot of reporting to do about that and about what possible what potential solutions there are uh, to all the problems that uh, that uh, that uh, are, are have been generated by it. Elizabeth, how do you see things changing for you or at all, if at all um, at the end of the Trump era? Well, I'm hoping that no, no matter what happens, that local news is in a, an absolute um, glory days are ahead and we have a flourishing rebuilding that takes the best of the past and adds new good things to it, more diverse representation at every level um, on down. So either way, I think that's, I hope, an outcome of the Trump era is we all see the, the importance of civic engagement from the ground up and we invest in it. And Kevin? Well, first of all, like what, what Elizabeth is doing is, you know, I, I love the passion she's putting into it and, and, and it makes me feel a lot confident about the future of local news. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, Lynn, Lynn has set a really great, great model as, as what a, a leader is in a newsroom, which we need um, with, with kind of confidence and openness. Um, you know, I love what I see in, in the, in the world that I operate in now, that's just really diverse in form, you know, and I'm really interested in ways of reaching people. And, and I, I think that's a big promise. You see a lot of what people are doing on platforms like TikTok and Instagram, uh, you know, people laugh at things like memes, but there's a lot of really creative ways to reach people with messages. And, and you're seeing this in the, this election cycle and, and elsewhere. And I think that, offers a lot of possibility. Like we have to be able to reach people with whatever we're, we're producing. And I think that's, that's an exciting um, uh, thing to look forward to. Len? Yes. Your turn. I think Judy. I think we've all answered your question. Judy get frozen again? Yeah. Hello. Judy, thank you very much. So let's, uh, so uh, we will wrap up. It's nine o'clock. Uh, Kevin, thank you very much. Elizabeth, thank you very much. I've already told Elizabeth offline that I'm very interested in what's going on with this new local news movement across the country. I think it's very important. We're going to see that, in fact, over the next weeks when we watch how local news covers, how people actually vote, which is not done nationally, it's done locally in states and cities and counties. Votes will be counted in states and cities and counties. And so it's extremely important uh, that local news media cover that well for people. Uh, and we just launched a new, a, a pop-up newsroom called Vote Beat. So check it out, votebeat.org. Really, okay. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. It's Thank hard to keep up with this. Thank you for together with your tremendous book. Right. Well, my, my computer has gone down three times in the last yeah. three minutes. So I'm going to hold up Len's book again and just say thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. All about the story. Uh, go to, go to uh, watch, watch and read what Kevin Merida uh, does uh, every day. And Elizabeth Green with, with Chalkbeat, you guys are just the best. And I've loved this conversation. Thank you so much. On thank behalf you. of the New York Public Library, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. Black text on white background, New York Public Library, Lion logo, 125 years.
Learn more about the New York Public Library, nypl.org. Hello.